Boy, things sure have changed since Thomas Edison first invented this in 1877. Where have they? Edison's first machine used tin foil wrapped around a rotating cylinder. When he spoke into the horn, his voice wiggled the air, and a diaphragm, a lot like an eardrum, wiggled a needle that was in contact with the tin foil. As the cylinder rotated, the needle left wiggling impressions of his voice behind. Then he made the needle track over the same wiggles, and the needle wiggled the diaphragm, and the diaphragm wiggled the air, and the music industry was never the same again. It's a pretty far cry from a modern record player, isn't it? Nope. This 1980s version of Edison's first record stores sound in exactly the same way. You can prove this to yourself if you want. It's just an ordinary safety pin in a cone of paper. But try it with a record you don't care about, because the pin's pretty hard on those tiny wiggles. The biggest difference between how Edison made his first recording and the system in your house is electromagnetism. When an electric current's passed through a coil of wire, magnetism results. And the effect works the other way, too. When a magnet's passed through a coil of wire, an electric current results. This is what the world calls a speaker. It's got a coil of wire wrapped around a magnet down there, and that coil of wire is attached to a cone of paper. The whole thing's glued together in such a way that the paper cone can move in and out with the coil moving over the magnet. If I apply a little current to the coil, the cone moves out. If I reverse the current, the cone moves in. That's how a speaker changes wiggling electric currents into wiggles in the air that your ear can hear. The same speaker will also generate a wiggling electric current if I talk into it. A lot of microphones use that principle. Here's a phonograph cartridge I made myself. It also uses the electromagnetic effect. It's got a needle-like object, it's a nail in this one, glued to a magnet. And the magnet's attached to a piece of floppy material that lets the entire assembly move. The needle and magnet are inside a coil of wire. Now, if the needle's dragged through a wiggly groove on a phonograph record, it will generate a wiggling electric current that matches the wiggles on the record. Now, for those viewers who think the props on Acme School are just a little funky and that a piece of copper pipe and a nail have nothing to do with a real phono cartridge, This is a mono pickup. Stereo uses two pickup coils mounted at 90 degrees to each other. This phonograph cartridge will also work backwards. If I feed it a wiggling electric current, the needle will wiggle along with it. One use of the backwards phonograph cartridge is the backwards record player. This machine doesn't reproduce the wiggles in a record. It takes a disc of acetate and cuts the wiggly groove into it. There are several reasons why it doesn't look just like a record player. Since its needle is cutting the groove, it has no groove to follow, so the cutting head is moved along by an extra motor. Its needle is heated to make it cut into the record better, and so it can't slip under the pressure of cutting. It's held onto the turntable by suction. The electric wiggles that will cut the grooves are fed into the cutting head and wiggle the cutting needle in a pattern that's the same as the wiggling air that hit the microphone in the first place, except for a couple of things. The deep, low-frequency sounds tend to make long, big wiggles. In order to pack more sound on the record, the amplitude of the low-frequency sounds is reduced. That's why the record sounds so tinny when you play it with just a pin and cone of paper. The amplifier in a player restores that missing bass. The louder a sound is on the record, the wider the groove will be. This machine predicts the future. It's the tape machine that's feeding the record cutter. An extra head on the machine picks up the signal before it reaches the main head, and it sends an advance warning to the motor that spaces the grooves to increase the spacing just before a loud passage. When this machine is done doing its job on the blank record, you have a record that's the same as the one you take home from the store, but you don't play this one. This is the piece of acetate that was on the record cutting machine. It's being washed. Now it's being sprayed with silver. The fine silver coating allows the acetate to conduct electricity. Why? It's gonna be nickel plated.
Electroplating is a method used to deposit fine coatings of metal onto things. When it's all done, it can be pulled off as a negative metal copy of the original that was cut. It's called negative because instead of grooves, it has bumps. This one could be used to press records, but instead, it's plated to make a mother. The mother is used to make the negative stampers. Why so many steps? To protect the original master from too many operations. A lot of stampers can be made from one mother. The stampers are carefully centered using a microscope and have a hole placed exactly in the middle. Records start their life as little pieces of polyvinyl chloride plastic. These are melted into lumps of hot plastic that look like cookies. They're called biscuits. The hot biscuit has two labels pressed against it. Then the biscuit's squashed between two steam-heated stampers that are the two sides of the record. Immediately following the squash, cold water replaces the steam under and over the stampers to cool the record. Now the record's spun for the first time in its life, and a knife trims the edge. It's complete. Well, it's complete, but the process isn't. Now it's complete. Talk about being the first on your block. I got the latest album by the hottest rock group before it was pressed. Recording sure has gotten a lot better. Too bad music hasn't.